It's a great uh, delight to be with you uh, this morning and, and uh, indeed, as David's already mentioned, very encouraged to see so many people uh, interested in participating in the colloquium this year. So uh, I'd like to also welcome you, those who have travelled particularly, um, welcome you to lovely Tasmania. We've put on a special uh, Tasmanian uh, winter morning for you, <laughs> but uh, you're, you're very, very welcome. And I look forward, and I'm sure you all do too, to the opportunity to the, during the day and the, the evening meal to, uh, to get to know each other and to uh, be able to share different perspectives, different experiences together. And I think that's one of the great values of uh, a colloquium like this. So uh, given this very topical, I'm opening the batting <laughs> this morning. Uh, and uh, as David mentioned, uh, my topic, which, which I believe is, is deeply uh, linked to the question of the rise of, of woke in, in our society, I, I want to speak about that reality to begin with. Uh, um, and then propose a, a, a way forward, maybe, that could be helpful in how, how we can respond uh, to this question of the rise of woke in, in, in our society. When we look at the uh, history of humanity and cultures uh, and, and the social structures that uh, underpin them, um, there's always been a point of stability, a reference point uh, for the development of culture and, 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 and moral structures. They've had some form of transcendent foundation. Now, whether it be the pagan gods of Greece and Rome, the noble truths of Buddhism, or the articulation of uh, Christian virtue uh, inspired by sacred scripture, Societies up to our own have always fashioned moral imperatives based on some transcendent order. And the moral structures have, in their own turn, defined the cultures and been a point of social cohesion. However, Western societies, as we, understand, as we know, whose foundations are really based in Christianity, have now entered a a stage of abandoning such a reference point. Replacing the Christian worldview, there is now an emphasis on individual moral perceptions alone. Having largely abandoned the Christian vision of, of human life, society now tends to be directed by popular social movements, which are based often more on emotion than on reason and on evidence. So such movements include, of course, we're very conscious of extreme climate activism, because the whole LGBTIQ uh, movement uh, with its focus on diversity and inclusivity. Activism, uh, particularly in the corporate and uh, sporting arena and so on. Such causes have become of paramount importance in our society and are so compelling to some, that the social elites believe they need to be forcibly imposed. And they tend to shift and change too, as society becomes interested and caught up in various and new issues. The LGBTIQ movement, as we know, has been very effective in using what at first glance, glance appears to be a rather innocuous concept the value of diversity or the value of inclusivity to push its radical sexual and gender ideology across society. They've been able to push the culture from toleration of what we would recognise, some of us would recognise as aberrant sexual and gender behaviour to the requirement that it be firmly affirmed. Not only does the media largely advocate this radical agenda, we now also find corporations and sporting bodies also pushing these agendas, wanting to publicly prove themselves, if you like, in touch or with it in the society and its, and its movements. Thus, they have diversity and exclusive, uh, exclusivity policies in corporations and mandate training for employees. And sporting associations have pride rounds, and I notice in the Headingley test there is um, 
to the bottom of the stumps, we have the rainbow uh, being put as a sign of showing their support for this, this particular agenda. What's happening, I believe, is that, that moral thinking has turned inward. It has not only become untethered from an orientation towards a transcendent, but has also discarded the need for a sound rational base. It's now grounded in personal feelings, feelings of individuals about various ethical issues. What's happened is that the moral order has become highly, if not completely, subjectivised. Now, in the past, ethical codes were based in an order defined by the existence of a divine or transcendent reality. In other words, we acknowledge that there was an existence of a higher objective or transcendent moral law which provided guidance as to how we should, how we should act in order to flourish and fulfil our nature. In this hour, our ethical beliefs had a certain teleology. They were aimed at an end, and that end was at least human flourishing, if not also having eternal significance. This approach understood that there was a greater purpose to human life beyond the mere satisfaction of desire and the proposed pursuit of virtue was seen as a central moral ideal. It is through the development of virtue that we're able to easily, to, to easily able to do the right and good thing, through which in turn we flourish as human beings and achieve our teleos or our end. This was at the, really the heart of Aristotelian ethics. Because Christian moral teaching has its source in divine revelation expressed in the sacred scriptures. It draws in, on, in particular on the Ten Commandments and the moral teachings of Jesus. However, the Catholic Church teaches that we can come to understand the divine moral law not just through divine revelation, but also through what we call the natural law, which involves the use of human reason. Essentially, the natural law is a participation in the divine law through which we are able to discover by the use of our reason. Through the natural law, we can discern the primary moral precept that it is good that it should be done and evil that should be avoided. Reflecting on the human inclination, we can then identify secondary precepts which involve goods such as life, human reproduction, education and so on, and the promotion and protection of these goods. These moral precepts of the natural law are not limited by culture or custom. They belong to all of humanity because all people were created by a wise and provident creator. Our society, sadly, now has large numbers of people who do not believe in the existence of God or any trans transcendent reality. And so I am moving from a transcendent frame of reference to an imminent frame of reference. Once the society no longer acknowledges the transcendent order as providing an objective basis for morality, anything then anything becomes, in principle, morally acceptable. And a properly ordered, civilised society really is no longer possible. Once a society no longer recognises and respects the existence of an objective moral law, there is only the law of the mob, or the law of the strongest and most powerful. And so we move along a path towards social collapse. A number of social commentators, of course, have been able to reflect upon and describe this process. And they're described in various ways. So we hear them speaking about the imperial, the emergence of the imperial self, or the expressive self. One commentator that I've been reading in recent times is Carl Truman, who in his book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, speaks of Two, uh, two, 
to, to uh, practices, what he calls mimesis and poesis. This is what he says. Put simply, these terms refer to two different ways of thinking about the world. A monadic view regards the world as having a given order and meaning, and thus sees human beings as required to discover that meaning and conform themselves to it. Poesis, by way of contrast, sees the world as so much raw material out of which meaning and purpose can be created by the individual. Drawing on the thought of uh, Philip Rieff, he describes three types of worlds. The first is the pagan world with moral codes based on myths. The second world is where the moral outlook is based on belief in a transcendent God. And the third world has a moral outlook which is devoid of the transcendent element and so is based on nothing beyond the individual human person. Rief further comments that the third world, world view actually becomes an anti-culture as he sees moral frameworks, as they see moral frameworks as being oppressive and restrictive of human freedom. Such a worldview readily dismisses the old moral values as impotent and not a little ridiculous. Truman maps out a path that humanity has taken as it has distanced itself from the Christian vision of life. He describes the emergence of the psychological self, which he traces back to the Enlightenment of the 18th century, citing, among others, Jean-Jacques John Jean Rousseau, who said, all I need to do is to look inside myself. This is further advanced, in Truman's view, by the romantic poets like Wordsworth, Blake and Shelley. Truman identifies an ethics based on aesthetics. It is what feels right that is right. Here Truman sees the seeds of the, the therapeutic culture where one's personal desires are paramount. Truman then describes the emergence of a plastic self where a person considers that they can make and remake themselves as they wish. With these changes in self-understanding, so the way of moral thinking also has changed. Ethics is now a function of feeling, devoid of rational thought. Such thinking is based on personal preference alone. Alastair McIntyre, in his well-known book, After Virtue, describes such an approach to ethics as emotivism. What is viewed as morally good is simply what I feel is good. And the goal of moral choice is actually now self-actualization or self-expression. And such patterns of thinking have become so preoccupied that it comfortably denies evident biological reality, as we see in the transgender movement. When moral thinking becomes subjective, an immediate effect is that moral living no longer has a true communitarian dimension. Society has been fractured into individual preferences, and the notion of the common good evaporates. When this occurs, we are now entering into an era of anti-culture. I'd like to look now at a possible way forward from all of this. In the philosophical thought, which can be traced back to Plato and has been taken up in the Catholic intellectual tradition, there is the notion of three particular transcendentals, truth, goodness, and beauty. They are called such because they are basic attributes of being. All things have these properties. Properly understood, they exist perfectly in God. They are properties of the nature of God. 
So God is truth. God is goodness. And God is beauty. They are attributes that all beings have to some extent, but they exist perfectly in God. The transcendentals give us glimpses into what is metaphysical or spiritual. They direct us towards something which is much more and which is beyond ourselves. Perfection of being. And ultimately they are directed towards God. When we reflect upon the mind of our contemporaries, we note that the notion of objective truth and indeed of the value of goodness, which is more, sorry, goodness, is no longer affirmed, but as a result, it's no longer pursued. So objective truth, appreciation of goodness, are largely outside the realm of modern society. But I'd like to look at the question of beauty. While we can see that the ideal of beauty has been under attack in various ways in our society, and I take the example of Dark Mofo here in Hobart, there's always something that is more, that, that there is always some more basic inclination to beauty in the human person that is harder to suppress. It's evident to all that beauty exists as a quality that attracts. We cannot be, but be moved, moved by the experience of beauty. And I would propose that beauty is a path which one can experience the radiation of God. But I suppose we have to, have to ask ourselves the question, what is, what is beauty? How will we define beauty? And of course, this has been something that has intrigued both philosophers and artists alike. So speaking of philosophers, Edmund Burke attempted to grasp the nature of beauty by considering the question of proportion. So in his uh, essay, A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Beautiful and the Sublime, he said this, turning our eyes to the veg vegetable kingdom we find nothing there so beautiful as flowers. But flowers are of every sort of shape and every short sort of disposition. They are turned and fashioned into an infinite variety of forms. The rose is a large flower, yet it grows on a small shrub. The flower of an apple is very small and it grows on a very large tree. Yet the rose and the apple blossom are both beautiful. The swan, confessedly a beautiful bird, has a neck longer than the rest of its body and but a very short tail. Is this a beautiful proportion? We must allow that it is. So if Edmund Burke, beauty is related to proportion. Another philosopher, 18th century philosopher, David Hume took another view. He believed that beauty was really in the mind of the beholder. So he says, beauty is, of, has, is no quality in things themselves. It exists merely in the mind that contemplates them. And each mind perceives a different beauty. One person may perceive a deformity where another is sensible of beauty and every individual ought to acquiesce in his own sentiment without pretending to regulate those of others. So the philosophers aren't too sure. But what do the poets think about beauty? I'd like to give some attention to the thought and writings of the poet Jared Manny Hopkins, That's certainly a favourite of mine. He was much engaged with the question of the nature of beauty and for him, the source of beauty was God himself. He writes in his poem, God's Grandeur, that the world is charged with the grandeur of God. He saw nature as replete with beauty, and he coined his own words to depict his understanding. He spoke of the way in which inscape of a thing is instressed 
upon the human faculties. For Hopkins, there, there is a, a way of seeing nature that impresses its inner radiance upon us. What is within nature at times will flame out, as Hopkins says, like shining from shook foil. We all experience beauty, yet what may appear common has something wonderful to reveal to us, as Hopkins expresses, that there always lives the dearest freshness deep down things. So Hopkins is aware that the perception of beauty leads to a recognition of the source of that beauty, which is the creator himself. If I may just allow his majestic movement of words and sounds in his poem, Pied Beauty, to give us a moment to contemplate how the perception of beauty opens the soul to God. Glory be to God for dappled things, the skies of coupled colours, a brinded cow, for rose moles all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal, chestnut falls, finches' wings, landscape plotted and pierced, fold, fallow and plough, and all trades their gear and tackle and trim, all things. Counter, original, spare, strange, whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how. With swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzled dim, he fathers forth, whose beauty is past change. Praise him. I believe that contemporary society needs to find a starting point to rebuild the consciousness of the transcendent. And I would propose, along with the Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar and Joseph Ratzinger, later of course, Pope Benedict XVI, that the appreciation of beauty is a place where we can all begin. Von Balthasar, in his three-volume monumental work, The Glory of, of the Lord, begins with a theology focused on the notion of beauty as a transcendental. He is convinced that we must start with beauty before treating of goodness and truth. He considers that the contemplation of beauty is actually the way to contemplate divine love. And beauty opens us then, as he would say, to the glory of the Lord. When we encounter beauty, we are drawn towards that which is beautiful. But we're taken beyond that to the source of that beauty. Beauty opens us, very simply, to the discovery of God. So he says, beauty is the last thing that the thinking intellect dares to approach, since it only dances as an uncontained splendor around the double constellation of the truth and the good, and their inseparable relation to each other. Beauty is the disinterested one, without which the ancient world refused to understand itself, a word that both imperceptibly and yet unmistakably has bid farewell to our new world, a world of interests, leaving it to its own avarice and sadness. The experience of beauty, as we know, seizes the senses and causes a person to pause in wonder Think of witnessing a glorious sunset or a natural vista. When we see beauty, we are actually captivated and lifted beyond ourselves. We encounter with the beautiful what is like a wound of an arrow that strikes the heart and opens our eyes to deep to the deeper reality of things. Listening to a Bach cantata gazing upon an icon, walking through a medieval cathedral. We find in these instances that we are transported to another place. When we experience the great works of the Christian tradition, the place we're going to is the place of faith. Somehow these moments draw us to touch the divine. 
Now let me turn my attention now to the thought of Joseph Ratzinger. The notion of beauty long engaged his thinking. As Pope, the theme was taken up in a number of his writings. For example, in 2002 he said, I've often affirmed my conviction that the true apology of the Christian faith, the most convincing demonstration of its, of its truth, are the saints and the beauty that faith has generated. Ratzinger is convinced that beauty will open people to discovering faith. And he comments in referring to young people who have become estranged from the faith that a sacred image can express much more than what can be said in words and be an extremely effective and dynamic way of communicating the gospel message. Based on this conviction, Ratzinger considered that beauty had a vital role in the celebration of the sacred liturgy. He's not proposing here a certain aestheticism, an elite pursuit of perfection. Rather, he sees the beauty in the liturgy not as mere decoration, but rather an essential element of the liturgical action, which is an attribute of God himself. And he encouraged priests to be more conscious of the, what he calls the Ars Celebrandi. Because he's aware that the reverence of the priest, the palpable piety with which he celebrates the Eucharist, can move the faithful to a greater participation in sacred mysteries. In a homily at a mass at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York in 2008, Pope Benedict reflected on how stained glass windows in a great cathedral, which from the outset, outside can look plain and lifeless, but when light flows from, with, from outside, they are radiant with colour and beauty. So he comments, only, it is only from the inside, from the experience of faith and ecclesial life that we see the church as it truly is, flooded with grace, resplendent in beauty, adorned by the multiple, multi manifold gifts of the spirit. There's a beauty, in other words, to be discovered in the faith. Benedict's convinced that beauty should be at the heart of the way in which the liturgy is celebrated in order that the heart will be able to be lifted to the contemplation and worship of God. Pope Benedict saw that beauty captured in the authentic celebration of liturgy becomes in fact a radiation of God. So like the rest of Christian revelation, he says, the liturgy is inherently linked to beauty. It is a veritatis splendor. The liturgy is a radiant expression of the paschal mystery, which Christ draws us to himself and calls us to communion. When beauty is in evidence in the celebration of the sacred liturgy, then it becomes a path to true worship of God. And beauty here is at the same time both physical and spiritual, an intersection of the visible and invisible. So, to conclude, modern society, I, I believe, has greatly lost sight of a transcend, transcendent point of reference for human life. But we cannot absolutely suppress the human heart's desire for the divine and for the transcendent. The modern person struggles to find a way to the transcendent via the path of truth and goodness. But I believe there is hope and possibility in the way of beauty. Thank you.